Hello students, welcome back to chapter 10, Gravitation. In chapter 9, we have learned that mass of an object is the measure of its inertia. Greater the mass, greater is the inertia. And you know, the mass of an object is constant and does not change from place to place. That means on a particular, wherever we go, the mass remains the same. The earth attracts every object with a force and this force depends on the mass of the object and also the acceleration due to gravity. The weight of an object is the force with which it is attracted towards the earth. So what is weight? Weight of an object is the force with which an object is attracted towards the earth. According to Newton's second law of motion, we have learned that force is the product of mass and acceleration. F is equal to m multiplied by A where F is the force, mass, m is the mass of the object and A is the acceleration. Here, a can be replaced by g which is the acceleration due to gravity. Therefore, we can write f is equal to m multiplied by g. The force of attraction of the earth on an object is known as the weight of the object. And weight is denoted by capital letter w. And when you substitute this in the equation f is equal to m multiplied by g we get W is equal to M multiplied by G that is weight of the object is equal to mass of the object multiplied by acceleration due to gravity. As the weight of an object is the force with which it is attracted towards the earth. So the SI unit of weight is same as that of the force because we have seen that weight is the gravitational force acting by uh, exerted by the earth on an object so as it is a gravitational force the SI unit will be same as that of the force that means the unit of weight and force remains the same so SI unit of weight then it is Newton denoted by capital letter N the weight of a force the weight is a force acting vertically downwards. It has both magnitude and also direction. We have already learned that the value of acceleration due to gravity is constant at a given place. Therefore, at a given place, the mass of an object is directly proportional to the, sorry, so at a given place, the weight of an object is directly proportional to the mass. And it is due to this reason, we can use the weight of an object as a measure of its mass at a particular place. And you know that mass of the object or mass of any object remains the same everywhere. That is, whether it's on the earth or whether it's on the moon or whether it's on the Mars or any planet, the mass remains the same. But the weight of the object, it depends upon the location of the object. Is that clear? Now we can see weight of an object on the moon. Or what is the relation of weight of an object on the moon and the, that of the earth? The weight of an object on the earth is the force with which the earth attracts the object. In the same way, the weight of an object on the moon is the force with which the moon attracts that object. So, you know that the mass of the moon is less than that of the earth. So, due to this, the moon exerts a smaller force of attraction on objects. And how to find out the weight of an object on the moon? Because we have already seen that 
weight is the gravitational force acting so weight of an object on the moon will be the same as that of the gravitational force exerted by moon on that particular object so according to universal law of gravitation we have already deduced one formula to find out force so that will be same as that of the weight so weight of the object on the moon is equal to gravitational constant g multiplied by mass of the moon multiplied by mass of the object upon radius of the moon square same way weight of the object on the earth is equal to gravitation constant g multiplied by mass of the earth multiplied by mass of the object upon radius of the earth square to compare this divide mass of the ob sorry divide weight of the object on the moon with the weight of the object on earth that means take the ratio wm upon we we get it as 1 upon 6 after substituting the values so gravitational constant g is the same and then weight of the sorry mass of the earth then mass of the moon radius of the earth and radius of the moon after substituting the values we get the ratio as 1 upon 6 that is weight of the object on the moon upon weight of the object on the earth is equal to 1 upon 6 from this is very much clear that weight of the object on the moon will be 1/6 the weight of the object on the earth is that clear so next topic it is thrust and pressure listen to the figure which is given there here a poster is fixed on the wall with the help of drawing pins you know that how to fix a poster on the wall we are using drawing pins and this drawing pins are pressed with the thumb perpendicular to the board now listen to the activity suppose if you want to fix a poster on a bulletin board as which is shown in the figure you will have to press drawing pins with your thumb in that case you are applying a force on the surface area of the head of the pin where you apply the force on the head or the flattened part or the pointed part the flattened part that means the head of the pin and this force it is directed perpendicular to the surface area of the board and this force act on a smaller area at the tip of the pin as a result of that the pin goes into the board and the poster can be fixed there listen to another situation when you stand on a loose loose uh, sand your feet go deep into the sand isn't it but instead instead of that you just lie down on the sand will your body go deep into the sand then no it's not possible and in both cases the force exerted on the sand is the weight of your body but in two different ways the first case you are standing and the second case you are lying on the sand what is the reason why in the second case uh, you are uh, you are not going deep into the sand you have learned that weight is the force acting vertically downwards here the force is acting perpendicular to the surface of the sand the force acting on an object perpendicular to the uh, surface we call it by the name thrust then how can you define thrust thrust is the force acting on an object perpendicular to the surface now come back to the situation that we had discussed when you stand on a loose sand the force 
that is the weight of your body is acting on an area equal to the area of your feet when you lie down the same force act on an area equal to the contact area of your whole body and in which case the area is larger while you stand or you lie down definitely when you lie down on the surface or on the ground or or on the sand the area is more thus the effect of force on the same magnitude on different areas they are different so in the first case the force is acting on a small area that means on your foot but in the second case the force is acting on a larger area the complete body so in these cases the thrust the force acting is the same that is the thrust is the same but the effects are different therefore the effect of thrust depends on the area on which it acts so in the first case the area was less so the effect was more in the second case the area was more so the effect was less the effect of thrust on sand is larger while standing than while lying the thrust on unit area is called by the name pressure so how can you define pressure then or how can you write the formula of pressure pressure is equal to thrust upon area that means the thrust or the force the perpendicular force thrust means the perpendicular force that act on unit area of a surface it is called by the name pressure so pressure can be uh, calculated by dividing the thrust with area so pressure is equal to thrust upon area so by substituting the unit of thrust and area we get the unit of pressure the si unit of thrust it is newton and that of area it is meter square therefore the si unit of pressure it is newton per meter square or newton meter raised to minus 2 in honor of the scientist blessy pascal the si unit of pressure is called pascal it is denoted as pa p capital and a small is that clear and now listen the formula itself pressure is equal to thrust upon area from that it's very much clear that the same force acting on a smaller area exerts a larger pressure and a smaller force acting on a large area smaller force sorry and a smaller pressure on a larger area so what is it the same force acting on a smaller area exerts larger pressure and a smaller pressure on a large uh, a smaller pressure on a larger area and this is the reason why a nail has a pointed tip and the knives that we use at home they have sharp edges and buildings they have wide foundations so now we can see how pressure acts on fluids what are fluids all liquids and gases they are fluids a solid exerts pressure on a surface due to its weight same way fluids also have weight and they also exert pressure on the base and walls of the container in which they are enclosed pressure exerted in any confined mass of fluid is transmitted and diminished in all directions now have you heard of the term buoyancy what is buoyancy we can understand it with the help of an activity take an empty plastic bottle 
close the mouth of the bottle with an airtight stopper. Put this bottle in a bucket which is filled with water. You know that. What happens? Definitely the bottle will float. Then what you have to do is push the bottle into the water. Then you feel an upward push. Try to push it further down. You will find it difficult to push deeper and deeper. Water exerts a force on the bottle in upward direction. You can try this activity. Then release the bottle or uh, remove your hand. As soon as you release the bottle, as soon as you remove your hand, you can see the bottle bounces back to the surface. What do you think? Does the force due to gravitational attraction of the earth act on this bottle? If it is in that way, why doesn't the bottle stay immersed in water after it is released? If there is force of attraction by the earth, even after releasing the bottle also, it should be immersed in water. But here what you, what you have noticed is that as you release the bottle, the bottle comes up. What's the reason? Now, the answer to the first question. Does the force due to gravitation, gravitational attraction of the earth act on the bottle? Yes. The force due to gravitational attraction of the earth acts on the bottle. In which direction? In the downward direction. The upward force exerted by water on the bottle is greater than the downward force. And that's the reason the bottle does not stay immersed in water but floats. Have you understood that? Here in this case, there are two forces acting on the bottle. One is the gravitational force which is exerted by the earth that acts in the downward direction. But at the same time, another force which is exerted by water acts on the bottle which is in the upward direction. Here, the upward force of the water is greater than the gravitational force. That's the reason why the bottle floats on water. How then, how can you immerse the bottle in water? When the bottle will be completely immersed in water? Only when the gravitational force exerted by the earth is more than the force exerted by water, then the bottle will be immersed in water. For that, you can fill the bottle with sand and then put it in water. Definitely the bottle will sink. Here the gravitational force is greater than the upward force of the water. That's the reason why the bottle sinks in water. Now. This upward force exerted by the water on the bottle, it is known as upthrust or buoyant force. All objects experience a force of buoyancy when they are immersed in a fluid. The magnitude of this buoyant force, it depends upon the density of the fluid. Now, why the objects float or sink? when placed on the surface of water. Here only we have seen, when you put some objects in water, they float on water. But some other objects, they sink in water. For that, listen to this activity. Take a beaker filled with water. Take an iron nail and place it on the surface of water. What happens when you keep an, keep an iron nail on the surface of water, the nail sinks. The force due to the gravitational attraction of the earth on the iron nail pulls it downwards. So on the iron nail, 
there is an upthrust which is exerted by water that means upthrust of water on the nail also acts and that upthrust pushes it upwards but here the downward force acting on the nail is greater than the upthrust of water on the nail as a result of that the nail sinks so listen to another activity take a beaker filled with water and take a piece of cork and an iron nail of equal mass place them on the surface of water what happens the cork will float but the iron nail will sink this is because of the difference in densities and the density of a substance is defined as the mass per unit volume that you have already learnt density is equal to mass upon volume and here the density of the cork is less than the density of water so we can say that an object if its density is less than that of water that object will float on water and if the density of the object is more than that of water that object will sink in water here we have taken a cork and iron nail the density of the cork is less than that of water that's why the cork floats on water whereas the density of the iron nail is more than that of water that's why the iron nail sinks in water so if the, the density is less than the density of water already i told you and this means that the upthrust of water on the cork it becomes greater than the weight of the cork so that's why the cork will float the density of iron nail is more than the density of water and that means that the upthrust of water on the iron nail is less than the weight of the nail so it sinks therefore objects of density less than that of a liquid in general if you want to say the density of the object is less than that of the liquid then that object will float on the liquid the objects of density greater than that of the liquid that sinks in the liquid is that clear next topic archimedes principle so listen to this activity take a piece of stone and tie it to one end of a rubber string then suspend the stone by holding the string just see the string how much elongation is there to the string note it down then slowly dip the stone in water in a container as shown here in the figure observe what happens to the elongation of the string so in the first case the stone tied with a rubber string and the second case the stone is dipped in water so the elongation of the stone in the first case or oh sorry the elongation of the stone in the second case that means when it is dipped in water is less than that of the first case the elongation of the string decreases when the stone is dipped in water due to the upward force exerted by water on the stone that means as you dip the stone in water the elongation becomes less is that clear we know that the elongation produced in the string is due to the weight of the stone since the extension decreases once the stone is lowered in water means that some force act on the stone in upward direction as a result the net force on the string decreases and hence the elongation also decreases 
so we have already discussed earlier that this upward force exerted by water is known as the force of buoyancy and what is the magnitude of this buoyant force experienced by a body and is this force the same in all fluids for a for a given body do all bodies in a given fluid experience the same buoyant force so the answer to these questions is given by the given by archimedes and that is called as archimedes principle and archimedes principle can be stated as when a body is immersed fully or partially in a fluid it experiences an upward force which is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced by it and this archimedes principle has many applications it is used in designing ships and submarines lactometers which are used to determine the purity of a sample of milk and hydrometers used for determining density of liquids they are based on archimedes principle now relative density we have already seen that density of a substance is defined as the mass per mass per unit volume or density is equal to mass upon volume and the unit of density is kilogram per meter cube or kilogram meter raised to minus 3 the density of a given substance under specified conditions remains the same therefore the density of a substance is one of its characteristic properties and density is different for different substances for example if you take gold its density it is 19300 kg per meter cube whereas that of water it is 1000 kg per meter cube the density of a given sample of a substance can help us to determine the purity of the given substance so what is then relative density the relative density of a substance is the ratio of its density to that of water that is relative density is equal to density of the given substance upon density of water so here the relative density it's a ratio of similar quantities that is both numerator and denominator is a density only so this relative density it has no unit is that clear i hope the chapter is clear to you thank you